Okay, data analysis part two. This is going to be focused uh, a little bit more on the um, on the vis on the visuals, right? How to how to visualize and portray data. Uh, a few more numerical summaries, though. So we're not done with numerical summaries completely. Um, so we're going to have a few more examples and ways to calculate and portray data numerically, and then the majority of it's going to be on um, graphical depictions. So again, the outline is numbers and charts. So continuing on with summarizing data with numbers, this gets a little bit into um, more into things that are directly applicable in risk analysis and things we will explore further when we get into probability and statistics and, and how, we, how we use that in risk analysis. So we're gonna talk about a few concepts here. One is just a general refresher on moments um, central tendency, which is just the probability term for typical value. Um, dispersion, which is just the probability term for um, variability. Um, asymmetry is, as, as the name implies, is describes um, whether or not your uncertainty is symmetrical about the, um, about the typical value, right? So are values higher than typical about the same likelihood as values that are lower than typical, right? Are they is it symmetrical or is it or is you know are high values uh, more likely than you know lower than average values, which would indicate that your data is asymmetrical. And then we'll touch on um, correlation of, of data sets. All right, so refresher of moments again. If you're maybe not all of you, but I think. Uh, Many of you are probably have an engineering background. So we all learned about moments in engineering mechanics, right? Things like, you know, center of mass, moment of inertia, et cetera, et cetera. So moments in, in risk analysis and in probability and statistics are uh, mathematically the same thing as they are in engineering mechanics. Um, so the general definition here for a moment that applies to probability and statistics, mechanics, physics, any other application, is um, the expected value of the product of some distance and a physical um, quantity or a function, right? So in um, engineering mechanics, we're often interested in, you know, distance from the centroid, right? If we're talking about something like moment, second moment, like moment of inertia. Uh, similarly, or analogously in probability and statistics, we're interested in oftentimes in either the distance from the mean of our data or the distance from the origin, right, the zero point. So again, um, this is what it looks like formally, mathematically, right? It's the integral of this um, distance raised to some power um, times, the, times the value of the function. So um, the n is the is the moment, right? So n can be the zero moment, first moment, second moment, third moment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And f of x can be any function, or in engineering mechanics, it might be you know an object or a shape, like uh, like in structural analysis, maybe like an I beam or something like that. So that's the general definition, right? So how do we how do we apply this in um, in risk analysis and probability and statistics? So the the first moment. So n equals one is the mean. So you can think of it as the in probability and statistics formally, it's called the, the raw first moment of area. Um, first moment meaning n equals one, the exponent is one, and the raw moment meaning it's um, relative to the origin or the zero point. Um, in engineering mechanics, this is the center of centroid or the center of mass of an object. In Excel, Excel doesn't have a mean function, so you just use the average function. It calculates the arithmetic mean. Um, in base R, there's a function called mean you can use. And again, the sample mean, we've probably all done this calculation before, right, is we just um, add up the data and divide by the number of data. So if we tie that back to the formula on the previous page, right, this is this is when dealing with a, with a function. Um, this sample mean is when we're dealing with discrete data, right? But it's the same concept. So for the first, the first raw moment, right? C is the origin, so C is zero, right? And X is, um, or sorry, N is one, right? The first moment, 
So it's just it's just x, right? So it's just um, uh, x times f of x dx, right? And so when we apply that into discrete space uh, for a discrete set of data, right? Again, c is zero because it's the origin for the for the raw moment, and uh, n is one. So it ends up simplifying to this formula where we can just add up our data values and divide by the total number of data, and that'll give us our sample mean from a discrete set of data. Um, if we want the mean of a distribution, right, we use that integral on the previous, where it's x times f of x uh, dx, right, will also give us the mean if we're dealing with a different distribution. So the calculation is a little different depending on if you're dealing with discrete data or a distribution, but they all tie back the fundamental definition concept of, of what a moment is. Um, other ways we can do central tendency is the median. So we touched on this a little bit earlier, but median is the 50th percentile. So that basically means half of our data is greater than and half is less than, or half of our distribution is above, half is below. Um, so it kind of splits the data in the middle. Functions in Excel and R for that. Right? And there's different reasons why you might want to use the median. Um, one of the applications where median is used would be with um, small sample sizes. So this ties back to this outlier question that came up earlier. Maybe you're doing, let's say an expert elicitation and you only have you know, four experts, so you have a small sample size. Um, what can happen is if you get any um, significant outliers, so you know, if anyone's way outside the range of everybody else, if you calculate a straight, straight um, arithmetic mean, um, those outliers can really influence and have a lot of leverage on the mean value so it can drag it you know way up or way down if if you have a significant outlier um, the median prevents that from happening with small sample sizes so it's uh, outliers tend to have less influence on the median than they do on the mean so sometimes when sample sizes are small um, we might want to represent the central tendency or the typical value with a median um, to avoid the, the issues that can creep in if you have significant outliers in your data set. Uh, another, another central tendency example is the mode, and we'll see this later in the week when we talk about distribution fitting. So mode is the either the most frequent or the most likely value. So some of the distributions we use and elicit in risk analysis, um, if anyone has done a risk analysis, you maybe have heard of the PERT distribution, and we'll, we'll see that later in the week as well. But a PERT distribution is a distribution that you can describe with three values, a minimum, a maximum, and a most likely value. Um, and because it only requires three values, it's often used in expert elicitation because it um, makes the elicitation easier. Um, but it's really important to recognize that uh, the value you're eliciting is the most likely value. It's not necessarily the mean value and it's not the median value. It's the most likely value. Um, so that's one application. Another application in distribution fitting, one of the, one of the um, methods for distribution fitting is called maximum likelihood estimation. And it's where we're trying to find um, the parameter sets that provide the most likely uh, fit to our data, right? So in those cases, we're basically trying to estimate the mode. Um, so that's another place where mode comes into play. So you'll see that from various various places and times, but it's important to recognize that mean, median, mode are not necessarily the same value and they're not necessarily interchangeable. And here's an example of that, right? So, and this will lead us into our discussion later on on symmetry. So if your if your uncertainty is symmetrical, so in other words, it's the, it's the same on both sides of the typical value then you will have a scenario where the mean, the median, the mode are the same value, right? So like a normal distribution, right? The traditional bell-shaped curve. The mean, the median, and the mode of a normal distribution are all the same value. Uh, but there are lots of distributions that are not symmetrical, right? So you get a distribution like this where the uncertainty um, stretches out farther, has a longer tail on the right-hand side, higher values than it does on the left-hand side. So uh, what will happen there is the mode will always still be the most likely value, right? So it will always be the peak of this, of this um, frequency curve. 
Um, the median will always split it in half, right? So if you were to calculate these areas, half of the area would be to the left of the median, and half of this area is to the right of the median. And the mean is always going to be calculated off of that formula for moments, right? So remember, moment is um, uh, has that distance element in it, right? So what happens um, when you have lots of values, large values way out here in the tail, what happens mathematically is you have these values up here that have a relatively large distance in that in that moment definition, right? So that large distance um, then tends to um, affect the estimate of the mean, and it will usually uh, it will drag it to the right of the median and the mode when you have these long asymmetrical tails in either your data in, or your distributions. So on average, because you have some values that can be really high, right, and you don't have values that can be really low, right, on you, you, your average value is going to be higher than your median or your mode. So that links right back to the to the moment equations, right? And again, if you th if you're an engineer, you can think of it in terms of engineering mechanics, right? If you have this if this shape goes has this long piece out here, it's going to drag the center of mass um, to the right, right, which is what the mean is in in the probability interpretation of, of moments. Okay, uh, real simple example. We won't spend a lot of time on these examples, but again, another data set, I think it's the same data set as the previous example. Uh, so the data with the corresponding rank, these aren't haven't been sorted, but you can see the corresponding rank here on the right-hand side. Um, the mean is simply just, again, arithmetic mean, just add up the data value set, everything in this first column, and um, divide by the total number of data, which is 10, and you get a mean estimate of 4.8. Median is the 50th percentile. So again, the rank is uh, going to be 0.5 over 11 or 5.5. So that means we're going to be halfway between our fifth and sixth rank values. Our fifth rank value is down here at uh, number four. Sixth rank value is uh, here at, uh, is a five. All right, so we're going to be halfway between five and six, or sorry, between four and five, halfway between four and five, which is 4.5. And then the mode is the value that happens the most, right? So again, this can get a little little bit weird if you have small data sets, um, but as the data sets get larger, you know, the weirdness should kind of dissipate. But, um, but just by definition, it's the value that happens the most number of times. So in this case, um, the number four occurred three times, which is the most, so that means our mode is four. So for this data set, just worked out that we have different values for the mean, the median, and the mode. They're not, you know, maybe not dramatically different, but they are different. And it's useful in risk analysis to recognize that there are differences between these three measures. Um, and then this doesn't show geometric mean, but, you know, you could calculate the, the um, geometric mean of these values. There's, there's different ways to do it. One way to do it would be to take the log of all these data and then take the um, arithmetic average of the logarithms right, and then convert that number back to real space by um, doing an inverse log calculation, right, and that would give you the geometric mean, you could, you could do that as well. Um, all right, next concept is dispersion, right, which just means uncertainty, right, so um, basically higher, higher dispersion or higher uncertainty means you have more variability or more, or more spread in your data or your uncertainty distribution. Lower dispersion means you have less variability and less spread in your distribution. So just two quick graphical examples of that. Dispersion um, is the second moment. And so it's analogous to like moment of inertia, right? So for the same same concept like in, in uh, engineering mechanics, right? And the, you can use, think of the old uh, the ice skater analogy, right? A, a figure skater, right? When they're trying to spin, Right. If they want to spin fast, they pull their arms in tight, right? So they have less dispersion, a, a smaller second moment, right? And they spin faster. If they want to slow down, right? They put their arms out. That gives them higher dispersion, right? For their for their mass, right? Um, which gives them a, a higher mode of inertia, right? Which slows them down. So you know, in terms of the analogy between 
probability and statistics in engineering mechanics, there's a lot of a lot of similarities here that you can use to your advantage to kind of um, think about some of these things. And then how we calculate it. So variance is, is again, as I said, is a second moment. Um, we transition usually for variance to the central moment. So central moment, uh, if you see the term central moment, that means we're calculating the moment relative to the mean. So when we calculate that distance in the moment um, definition, it's the distance to the mean. Um, variance has a bias in it. So um, when we calculate a variance for a data set, we will often do a little bias correction for um, the size of the sample that's in the sample variance formula. And again, it's analogous to moment of inertia and there's built-in functions in Excel and R. So for Excel, if you're doing a sample variance that has that bias correction and you want to use the var.s formula, that's the one you'll probably use most of the time if, if you're doing variance calculations. So again, the formula here, again, same general structure as the moment uh, definition from the first slide. Uh, again, this is in discrete space for discrete data sets, um, but again, it's X minus the mean, so it's the distance from the mean squared because it's the second moment uh, and divided by the total number of data. And then this N over N plus one on the front end is that bias correction um, that helps. Um, it doesn't fully remove the bias, but it does uh, reduce the bias that's in, uh, in, a, in a variance estimate when you have a you know, small to medium sized sample. A couple other things you can do with um, with the dispersion, a couple other different measures that are commonly used. One is standard deviation, which you might be more familiar with than variance. Standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. And again, there's formulas for that or built-in functions for that in, in many software packages. Um, and another common measure we use is the coefficient of variation, which is the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. Um, so this, in a sense, kind of normalizes things. Sometimes it's useful to think of you know, um, what's the variability as a fraction of the mean, right? So is the typical, is the, is the uncertainty, you know, large or small um, relative to the mean value? So this, this comes into play sometimes. Um, again, if you want to think in terms of things in kind of a normalized way, which sometimes helps makes it easier to do comparisons. Uh, sometimes it can help too with estimation, right? Maybe maybe through experience and practice and you know available data sets, we have found that you know the standard deviation for some soil property tends to be you know twenty to thirty percent of the mean, right? So if you're going out and collecting soil data for that property, maybe maybe you want to target the mean estimate and maybe use that coefficient of variation estimate to get a standard deviation right without having to collect a large sample to try to estimate it right. Maybe someone's already estimated that it's within a certain range. So sometimes it can be used in those kind of ways to get estimates of standard deviation without having to actually measure the standard deviation right. If you know that for a typical situation with the coefficient, coefficient of variation tends to be, right? You can use that for estimation purposes sometimes in risk analysis. So example of dispersion, same data, you're gonna get bored seeing this same data all the time. But uh, again, we can plug in the mean from our previous example, plug in each of the X values, and then use, you know, these ends cancel. I, I have them in here just to show that, you know, the, the moment is divided by N and this N over N minus one is technically the bias correction factor. Uh, so these cancel. Normally, you won't see the ends in in textbooks. Oftentimes, in this formula, but this just to show it more completely in terms of what the actual terms are and where they come from. Um, but again, if you plug plug that all in um, here, you will get these values uh, for sigma squared for each of these each of your data values. You can then add them up to get a total. And then that is your variance, and you can take the square root of it to get to your standard deviation, and you can take the standard deviation divided by the mean to get your coefficient of variation. All right, last last uh, concept here I think is asymmetry. So we measure asymmetry through the third moment, which is the coefficient of skewness. I'm actually not really sure what the equivalent 
uh, analogy would be an engineer mechanic. So, so if anyone knows, feel free to share that with, with us. Um, but it's the third standardized central moment. So we, uh, another new term in here, right? It's the third moment, it's the central moment, which means the distance we're calculating is from the mean. Uh, so the new term is standardized. So when you get the third and higher moments, they often report them as standardized moments, which means um, we normalize them by the, by the standard deviation. And you'll see that play out in the formula. Um, there's also a bias correction for sample size in the skewness coefficient. Uh, and again, there's formulas in both Excel. Well, there's in Excel, there isn't one in the base R package, but there's R has thousands of free packages that folks have developed that you can add into R. So there's lots and lots of different packages to choose from to do skew uh, formulas in, in, in R. Uh, so here's what sample skew looks like. Again, this first term n squared over n minus one, n minus two is the bias correction term. The second term is the moment calculation. So again, it's x minus the mean because it's the central moment. So that's the distance raised to the third power because it's the third moment divided by n because we have uh, n number of data and divided by um, sigma cubed because we're normalizing uh, by the standard deviation to get the standardized uh, moment. So this is, comp you don't, you know, in not every application do you have to standardize it, but it's in, it's probably the most common. So again, we saw this before, right? Asymmetry means you have basically a tail where, you know, you might have possibility of very high values or on the other side, very low values. Positive skew generally, as the name implies, means this tail goes in the positive direction towards high values. Negative skew uh, generally means these, these tails will go uh, towards the smaller values. Um, so that's how skew will come out in terms of positive or negative um, in terms of when you actually calculate it. Um, again, simple example, we won't go over all the details here, but you can just, you know, if you want to practice, you know, this is a data set you can practice and you just plug in your X value minus the mean qubit divided by N uh, times the same deviation cubed and put this bias correction factor on the front end. You should get each of these values in the table. Uh, you can add them up and that should give you a skew value. Skew is positive here, which means that things should be are, uh, asymmetrical. Uh, if it's symmetrical, the skew will come out to be zero or very close to zero. Uh, zero uh, skew of 0.369 means it's probably pretty asymmetrical with um, the tail to the right hand side. So high values being um, possible. Next is correlation. So correlation is important when we talk about either two random variables or two data sets. So correlation um, is really just a general term that can be used to define any statistical relationship between uh, two random variables or two variables. Um, different ways we can measure correlation, um, but generally um, the statistical relationship generally means that you know, if things are positively correlated, then that means high values of one variable generally um, correspond or go along with high values of the other variables. So that's this plot in the middle here, right? So if one's low, the other one's likely low. If one's high, the other one's likely high. Uh, negative is kind of the opposite of that, right? If, if one is high, the other one is likely to be low. And if one is low, the other one is likely to be high. And then low or no correlation just means there's really no relationship, right? Knowing the value of one of the variables doesn't give you any indication of, you know, what the value of the other variable might be. Um, we're not going to go too deep into these other these other concepts, but just so you know, you at least hear the terms. Um, covariance. Um, is basically the two-dimensional version of variance. So we talked about variance being um, a way to measure um, the second moment or the uncertainty of a, of a single variable. If you have two variables, um, you can measure the variance essentially between them, right? We call that covariance, co-meaning, you know, the, the variance between the two. Um, and then correlation, uh, and 
a lot of the metrics we use for correlation is just a normalized uh, covariance, right? So we calculate the covariance between two variables um, and then we normalize it and we call that correlation. So that's where correlation and the metrics for correlation come from. A uh, really important concept on correlation, it doesn't mean causation, right? So just because A and B are related in terms of their typical values doesn't mean A causes B, right? Um, so it's important to remember that. Um, probably the most common metric we use to measure um, correlation is Pearson's coefficient. Um, important to remember there that Pearson's coefficient is a measure of linear correlation. So you can have two variables that are correlated, but if they're not linearly correlated, maybe they're correlated in some nonlinear way, right? Pearson's co coefficient will be misleading, right? Because if the data is not, if the relationship's nonlinear, you're gonna get a Pearson's coefficient that suggests the data is not correlated because it's only looking at linear correlation. So you do have to be careful of that um, when you're doing some of these, some of these metrics. Um, another important thing is the R, which is usually the how they refer to Pearson's coefficient is not the same as the R squared we calculate when we like do a regression fit. So it's not the same as the coefficient of determination. It doesn't mean the same thing. And then of course there's a whole variety of methods that we're, we don't have time to cover in this class, but other ways to measure correlation for different situations. But the one you're going to encounter the most often in practice is going to be uh, linear correlation using Pearson's uh, coefficient. All right, now we'll talk about, uh, now we're done with numbers, so let's talk about pictures next, right? So how, how can we visualize our data with pictures, charts, and graphs? Um, the most important thing, and if you only take away one thing from this presentation, I think this is, this is what I'd like you to remember, uh, and it's that you should always, always, always plot your data and portray your data. Um, this is a classic example named after the person who came up with it um, to kind of show how important it is to visualize your data and not just rely on um, some of these numerical metrics. So these are four data sets, which I think you can see visually are obviously very different, right? In some very important ways. Um, but if you look at the, the numerical um, summaries of these data they're all the same so all four of these data sets have the exact same mean value for x have the exact same variance second moment for x so exact same variability exact same mean value of y exact same variance for y they all have the exact same pearson's correlation coefficient if you were to fit uh, fit a line to these data with a linear regression, they all have the exact same line fit to the data, and they all have the exact same coefficient of determination, which is kind of a just a rough indicator of the quality of the fit of the line. So um, again, can't emphasize this enough. Always, you always want to visualize your data because some of these metrics, if you're not careful, can be misleading and can lead you to some uh, misinterpretations of your data. All right, so lots and lots of way, way more than we could cover, even if we took the whole week to cover them. But here's here's just some of the ones we're going to just highlight in this presentation. So histograms, empirical distribution functions, empirical quantile plots, box and whisper plots, quantile quantile plots, uh, run sequence plots, lag plots, and four plots. And you'll get you'll get to generate some of these in the, in the exercise after this presentation. So what's a histogram? So a histogram is just a way to take um, our frequencies that we calculated earlier in the numerical summaries and produce a visual of our frequency, right? So a histogram is just the visual picture of frequencies. And there's different ways you can calculate and portray histograms. You can do them just as the frequency, right? Which is just a straight count. So on the vertical axis here, you can see these are just a straight count in terms of frequencies for different ranges of data values. Um, you can do it as a relative frequency, right? So these are percentages in this bottom left plot, right? Exact same data, just, you know, relative frequency calculated and portrayed uh, in this bottom left plot for the same data set. And then you can also, um, if you want to 
treat the data as if it is a continuous uh, variable. Um, you can also portray these as uh, probability densities here in the bottom right hand plot. Um, there's various rules of thumb. People always ask, well, how many bins, right? So we're usually breaking the data up when we do frequency and histograms into discrete bins and then plotting them. So a question comes up, how many, how many bins should I have? So this is one of one of many rules of thumb um, for how many bins. So uh, you take the maximum value uh, minus the minimum value, divide by two, divided by IQR, which is the interquartile range, which we'll cover in the box and risk plot, but basically the interquartile range is the difference between the, the third quartile or the 75th percentile and the first quartile or the 25th percentile. And then N, which is the number of data values raised to this minus one third power. And again, it's just a rule of thumb. Um, I actually don't know what Excel uses as a rule of thumb. Excel has some built-in histogram functionality now, um, but this is a common rule of thumb, but you'll see other, other rules of thumb. Basically what happens if you, if you have too many bins, you know, too many bins isn't good because you've sliced your data too thin and you can't really see the overall picture of your data. And if you have too few bins, right, everything's lumped together and you, you lose resolution that way as well. So, you know, there's no perfect number of bins, but um, there are some rules of thumb. Empirical cumulative frequency. So this is, you know, remember we calculated cumulative frequencies, which means less than or equal to. This is just the visual plot of that, right? So in this case, we have two data sets. We calculated um, cumulative frequencies for each of our data values same way as we saw earlier in the numerical data summaries. And then we just simply plot those values, right? So our data on the horizontal axis and our cumulative frequency on the vertical axis. Um, we can make some observations with these types of plots, right? By just by just by looking at them, in this case, maybe comparing these two um, data sets. So for example, um, you know, do we think these two data sets have a similar typical value? Right, maybe just for simplicity, we might pick the median as as our way of judging the typical value. And remember, median is at the 50th percentile, so it'll have a, it'll have a cumulative frequency of 0.5. Right, so you can quickly look at these plots and come over from 0.5 and you know roughly visualize what a typical value is and quickly see that they don't have the same typical value. Um, you can also ask, you know, do they have a similar variability or variance or similar magnitude of uncertainty. So generally on these types of plots, uh, a steeper slope will generally mean less uncertainty, right? So you have less variability across values here, right? Which will generally produce a steeper, steeper plot. So in this case, the one on the left is less steep than the one on the right. Um, so the one on the left has probably has, or almost certainly has a, a higher variance than the one on the right. So you can do things like that with these plots and make inferences about your data just by visualizing. Uh, an important point when you're visualizing data like this, another really fundamental thing that's super important that I see people not do often is if you're gonna portray information that you want someone to make a visual comparison off of, always make sure you're using a consistent scale, right? So you'll notice the plot on the left and the right have has the same range and layout for the X scale and the Y scale, right? So that you can quickly and easily make those visual comparisons. So that's really important. Um, another type of plot is the empirical quantile plot. So this is, remember when we, um, the other way of doing percentiles was to do them off of the ranking and we call that plotting positions. So this is just the, the graphical version of that, right? So we can calculate those, um, those um, percentiles off of the ranking, and then we can plot them. Uh, again, this is this example that you typically see in flood frequency analysis where we're looking at something like exceedance probability or annual exceedance probability versus maybe some flood discharge or stage based on observed floods. And again, you can make similar inferences about these data sets, right? Um, which one has a larger typical value? So in this type, in this style of plot, um, we have probability on the horizontal axis and the variable on the vertical axis. Um, the curve that's higher on the plot has a higher typical value. So it's gonna have a higher mean, median, et cetera. Um, and then in terms of variability, um, 
the one that has um, a steeper slope is going to be the one again that has the higher uncertainty. So the one on the left generally has a steeper slope than the one on the right. So it has it's going to have a higher um, variance. So you can again make inferences from from all these types of plots without having to actually calculate the uh, some of the metrics. Box and whisker plot. So this is um, the five number summary that we covered earlier, just shown graphically. So it's just the visual version of a five number summary. So again, uh, we can we can look at these values here. Um, and again, the typical value, this this solid line here in the middle of the box is usually the 50th percentile or the median. So again, you can look at these and make some in the size of, you know, the, the height of this box gives you an indicator of the uncertainty. The, the distance between the whiskers gives you, uh, again, another way of thinking about the uncertainty in these circles, which I'll talk about in the next slide, are ways to show outliers. So you can compare these two and say, well, do they have a, do they have a, um, do they have the same typical value? So I don't know, we'll, we'll make this a little bit interactive. Go ahead and type in the chat whether or not you think these two data sets have a similar typical value as indicated by the mean, which is this horizontal dark line in the middle of the box. So you just type in yes or no in the chat based on whether or not you think, yes, they have the same or about the same typical value or no, they do not. Excellent, see lots of lots of no's, that's good. So I guess most of you, uh, most of you saw the trick, right? So tried, I tried to tried to get you on this one and I obviously failed. You guys didn't fall for it. So the, if, you, if you're paying attention, you'll see that the scales here on the axes are different. They're not plotted at the same scale. So you can't just, you can't just do that, you know, quick immediate gut reaction of where they plot, right? You have to actually look at the corresponding values. And again, this is another reason why it's, another example why it's really helpful and really important to plot things on the same scale because it would be really easy for someone to look at this, right? And say, oh, those are about the same, right? when if you plotted them at the same scale, they would obviously be different. And, you know, you don't want to confuse confuse your audience, decision makers, whoever it is you're presenting information to. So again, always remember, try to plot things on the on the similar axis or same axes when you're when you're trying to communicate visual comparisons. All right, so this these these are what the specific values look like on a box and whisper plot and kind of the terminology that goes along with a box and whisper plot. So you have a, a few things here, right? So one is we generally will summarize uh, with a median usually as a as a solid line. Um, some sometimes people show the average as well as like a dashed line or some other some other symbology. Uh, but but that's not as common. The median is is pretty much the standard. Um, the range between Q1 and Q3, 25th and 75th percentile is the interquartile range. So we usually portray that as a solid box. So this gives you an idea of, of the, um, the general magnitude of the uncertainty, you know, within plus or minus, you know, a little bit of the, of the median or typical value. Um, and then the whiskers will normally extend to plus and minus one and a half times the interquartile range. And again, you won't see this consistently in the literature. You will see different, different techniques for where to plot these whiskers, but one of the more common ones is plus and minus. So it'd be minus 1.5 times this range, the interquartile range from the 25th percentile and one and a half times the interquartile range plus the Q3 percentile. Um, and then anything outside of that, anything that falls above or below these whiskers um, are usually classified as an outlier and just portrayed as, you know, individual points. So each individual data point you would show uh, that way as an outlier. Um, another standard kind of rule of thumb that's that's actually comes into play for this example is if when you calculate these whiskers, so Q1 minus one and a half IQR, if you calculate that whisker and it would extend beyond the either the maximum or the minimum value from your data set, we usually will then plot the whisker at the maximum or the minimum value, right? So we, we don't go beyond uh, the values for our data, right? So if we do this, and I think this is the case for this, this lower whisker here in this example, if you calculate this Q1 minus 1.5 of the interquartile range, 
you get a value that's less than the minimum value that was in this data set. So we just stop at the minimum value by convention. Um, so that's good to know when, when doing whisper plots. And again, software that does this for you will have all those rules usually baked into it. But it's good to know because there are some variations in how these whiskers are decided. Um, it's it's good to at least know what um, what specific method or rule rule of thumb, you know, whatever software you're using is applying to your data set, so you can make correct interpretations from the box and whisker. Um, QQ plot is called a quantile quantile plot. We use this oftentimes when we're comparing data sets to a distribution to get a feel for whether or not the data um, might be a good fit to a particular distribution. You can do it for all kinds of different um, analytical probability distributions. Uh, but what you do here is you calculate a theoretical quantile um, from the distribution that you're interested in. So in this case, this example here, it's a normal distribution. And you compare that to the quantiles or the percentiles we calculated from the rankings um, from our sample data set. So our sample quantile, and, and again, in, in, normal, in normal distributions and in general, uh, oftentimes we like to normalize things. So that's, you'll see that very commonly with normal distributions. Um, because then they all look and plot on similar scales, right? So you can quickly look at the plots and quickly make inferences when things are normalized. So in a normal distribution, there's a variable that's commonly called Z that's used to describe um, the very, uh, how we normalize a normal distribution. And the way we normalize it is we take our data value minus the mean. In this case, it'd be the mean of our data divided by the standard deviation of our data. And that gives us um, a Z, what we call a Z variant or a Z value. Um, and the nice thing about the Z value, it, it basically tells you um, how many, uh, how far away um, the, state, the, the value is from the mean, right? So if you're, if you're plotting here at a, 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 a sample quantile of one, right? That means that data value is one standard deviation above the mean. Two is two standard deviations above the mean, you know, and so on. Negative one is one standard deviation below the mean. So that's one of the reasons we normalize for these distributions is you can, again, you can quickly make interpretations about your data um, without having to, you know, do a bunch of math in your head. And then on the other axis, we do the theoretical quantile from a normal distribution. So in this case, um, we take the percentile that we calculated for our data value, plug it into a, nor a normal distribution. In this case, the, since we're normalizing, it'd be the standard normal distribution, and we get the corresponding Z value for the theoretical um, quantile of a normal distribution. And in Excel, it's the norm.s.inv. S means um, it's using the, the standard normal, right, which is the, this Z, this Z, um, this Z normalization. And again, visually, what you can tell from this plot, right, if, if it's a good fit to the data, if it generally follows along this line, right? So you would plot a one-to-one -one line here. This is a, essentially a one-to-one -one line, right? So um, if your data generally falls consistent with this one-to-one -one line, that's a visual indicator that um, the data is consistent with the distribution that, that you're testing, right? So in this example, we're testing a normal distribution, so this, suggests that it's a it's a fairly decent fit um, and fairly consistent with the normal distribution. All right, next type of plot is a run sequence plot. So run sequence plots basically means we just plot our data in order. Oftentimes we're doing this over time, but generically it doesn't have to be time, right? It, whatever the ordering might be, right? It's just plotting the data in order and looking to see whether there's any sort of trend, right? And again, most of the time in practice, we're interested in trends over time. So you usually see these run sequence plots where the ordering is based on time. Um, but again, you can visually see, right, the one on the left, no obvious trend. The one on the right, uh, you might pick up two trends here, right? One is that um, values look like they're generally increasing over time and also the variability, right, or the range of uncertainty in the values also looks like it might be um, increasing over time. So you can make interpretations like that from your from your data. 
Next one is a lag plot. This is when you're interested in correlation in the data. So this is the idea of, you know, is, is data um, truly independent, right? Does, does one data, uh, is one data, uh, is the current data value influenced by previous um, data value? So is this year's flood influenced by last year's flood kind of a thing? Um, so we can do this with lag plots. Again, normally these are done over time, but they don't have to be over time. Um, so the way we do this is we take um, a data value and plot it against um, the previous data value in, in order. So let's say if we were doing like maybe we were doing temperature, we wanted to see if today's temperature was had some autocorrelation, right? So we would plot today's temperature versus yesterday's temperature, right? And we would do that for each day for which we have data, right? So X is our data value, so it'd be the, the daily temperature. And lag one, one means we're going, we're going back one, lag means we're going back. So we would plot um, the previous data value, right? So the X axis would be today's temperature, lag one would be the corresponding temperature for yesterday. And we would plot that for all our daily temperature measurements. And basically, if, if things are not autocorrelated, you'll see a lot of spread and scatter in the plot. If things are correlated, in other words, if, you know, if it's temperature today is somewhat depends on the temperature yesterday, right? If it's warm yesterday, it's probably going to be similarly warm today, right? Um, you'll see these things start to coalesce around, a again, a one-to-one -one line um, on this plot. And I think we're coming up towards the end here. So for plot here is just a standard way of showing four of the plots we've already talked about on, on one on one visual so that we can make lots of inferences about our data from one plot that has four charts on it. And so it's a common way to summarize our data. Um, the four plots that are typically used on this thing are the one, run sequence plot, which again, often is we're interested in looking at trends over time. Uh, the lag plot in the top right, where we're looking to see whether our data is actually independent. The histogram, which we can get a quick visual maybe on what a typical value is, how big the uncertainty is, and whether the uncertainty is symmetrical. And then the um, quantile quantile plot, where we can uh, show whether or not our data might be a, a reasonable fit to a distribution, right, which could help us with selecting the model we're going to use or selecting the distribution we're going to use to model our data set in a risk analysis. Okay, a couple more things to wrap things up. So two other types of charts and graphs that, that we might use, scatter plot and QQ plots. So scatter plots um, oftentimes are used as kind of a visual way to kind of get a feel for correlation. So in this example, um, we have um, daily average inflow measurements at a dam, and we have daily average flow values recorded at a, at a nearby upstream gauge location. And so you can plot those data sets, right, uh, observations that were made on the same day, and see, you know, is there some correlation here such that I might be comfortable using, you know, daily average flow at the nearby gauge as a way to predict um, what the inflow is at my dam. And again, in flood hydrology, we would commonly use this to extend um, to extend our historical record beyond records that we might have maintained at the dam, right? If we have a nearby upstream gauge that has a longer record, and we can show that flow at the gauge is a reasonable predictor of inflow at the dam, then we can use that data at the gauge um, to extend our record and get a better estimate of the flood hazard. Um, so, Lots and lots of applications for this, but um, again, the scatter plot is just one way uh, we can kind of do a visual check on whether we think we might have some correlations such that we can use um, information from one data set to predict values for another data set. And then the QQ plot, QQ plot, um, we covered a little bit earlier, but um, in terms of seeing whether a particular data set fits a particular distribution. The other way we can use QQ plots is to see whether or not two data sets um, have the same um, probability distribution. 
So uh, again, what we're doing here is we're plotting the quantiles for two data sets and uh, we're comparing them to this one-to-one -one line. And again, if two, district, if two data sets have the same underlying distribution, they should plot pretty close to this one-to-one -one line. Um, now we can, again, we can make inferences and observations from this data set and how this plot looks. So um, since the data is generally um, linear, so these points that represent our data, it looks relatively linear. So that might be an indicator that the two data sets come from the same distribution. So, you know, if we were, you know, let's say it was a normal distribution, right? You know, they probably, if one comes from a normal distribution, they probably both come from a normal distribution because of this linear, general linear trend here in this plot. Um, the up, the upward shift, you know, sample B plots, or it's, it's plots above this one-to-one -one line. So that means that sample B probably has, even if they're from the same distribution, sample B probably has a higher uh, typical value, higher mean. And then the, the uh, fact that the slope is a little bit flatter than one-to-one, -one, so the slope of this solid line is one-to-one. -one. Um, the data plots at a flatter slope. So because it plots at a flatter slope, that's an indicator that sample B uh, would have a lower uh, variance than sample A. So again, you can use plots like this to make lots of various inferences about your data just by plotting it and just by understanding how these, these plots work. Um, so there was a question in the chat, are these all the same data? Um, I think a lot of these, like th this, these ones on the Q, th these ones on these plots, these QQ plots, and the ones I showed um, uh, on the box and whisker plots, um, Where's the box and whisker plots? The ones I showed here on the box and whisker plots, these plots where I'm showing comparisons, um, these empirical fre cumulative frequencies, these are all the same data sets, yes. So any of these ones that have comparisons throughout, right? I'm, I'm comparing the same data sets for each of these examples. Some of them, like this one, this one is its own data set. Some of these are their own data sets, right? But any of these ones that are comparisons, it was all using the same underlying data set. Uh, the four plot is one data set. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is, yeah, this is, I don't, uh, I'd have to look to see which one. This is one of the two data sets, right? So this, this one has two different data sets. I don't remember which one this is, whether it's A or B, but this is one of the, one of those two data sets on the four four plot. All right, so there's a question in the chat on the difference between empirical cumulative frequency and empirical quantile. So, um, the, so empirical cumulative frequency is basically um, calculated off of the count of the number of data less than or equal to a particular value. So in this cumulative frequency plot, right, whatever, whatever this, like if we were to come across here at 0.4 and whatever this value is, I don't know, maybe it's 980 or something, 990. Um, the cumulative frequency, we're, we're saying that 40% of our data has a value less than or equal to um, 980 or whatever, whatever the number is. Um, the empirical quantile comes from the kind of the notion of the percentiles we calculated earlier. So empirical quantile um, here is going to be, um, here it's plotted as an exceedance probability because this is a kind of a conceptually a flood example, flood data example. But uh, here the, the exceedance probability, well, it's two things are different. One is this is exceedance probability, which means greater than um, this is cumulative frequency, which means less than. So it's, they're the complement of each other, but they're not the same thing. Um, the other key difference is, um, so these cumulative frequencies are percentages off the data being less than or equal to a particular value. These um, empirical quantiles are based on um, percentiles that we calculate from the ranking of the data, right? So if we have 
you know, a hundred, let's say we have a hundred data values, right? Our empirical uh, quantile for our, our um, let's say our smallest value, right? Rank them small to high. Our smallest value is going to have a rank of one. We have a hundred values and we're using the Weibull plotting position. Our empirical quantile is going to be one divided by a hundred plus one. So it's going to be one over 101, whatever, whatever that number ends up being. Um, so we're working off the, we're calculating percentiles off of the rank of the data when we're doing an empirical quantile. When we're doing an empirical cumulative frequency, we're working off um, off of the data values, right? So we're we're counting how many data values are less than a particular value and calculating that as a percentage. So you will see, you know, for medium to large data sets, right? You will not see a huge difference, right? These look a little bit different because the axes are switched and this is calculated as an exceedance probability. And this is a, a non-exceedance or less than or equal to probability. Um, but other than that, right, you will visually, you won't see a, a big difference. So if I, if I switch these axes and calculated these empirical quantiles as non-exceedance probabilities, um, it would look visually, it would look very similar to these plots. Um, if you got down into the weeds on the actual numbers that go with each data value, they're going to be different because they're calculated differently. But again, in a lot of practical applications, it's probably not going to matter that much.